Welcome to New South After Reconstruction. This is Melinda Cole Klein. After Reconstruction began an era with the belief of a new South and that it would take shape. One feature of this new South involved the creation of industry and manufacturing. In time, capitalist ventures arrived in southern states to investigate its potential value regarding natural resources. Southern industries already established increased production. While extractive and not an economy based on manufacturing, the lumber industry would dominate the entire American market by the early 1900s. Enterprises coming south included mining, manufacturing, and lumbering was continued, and this led to the creation of new towns and villages where former cotton and corn fields once stood. While similarities between Northern and Southern Americans shared commonalities, years after the war in the South, a new ideological tradition to honor the past glories began with the cult of Confederacy. With this social movement, towns and cities formed veterans clubs. Towns and individuals raised monies to erect monuments. Most historians, including myself, acknowledge that until the Civil War, the South still resembled its colonial hierarchy and economy largely in place and fiercely reinforced by white society. While slavery had ended, it seemed to observers that realization of Southern industrial growth was mostly talk. In reality, Southern industry after Reconstruction largely failed. There's five reasons for this. I would like you to consider the following. Number one, companies owned by absentee investors. Number two, the resistance by the federal government to offer Southerners low interest loans. Number three, the use of non-Southern experts. Uh, this could be in the areas of finance, uh, industry, management, uh, engineering, people that had technical skills and that had uh, schooling in these areas. All right, number four, high railroad shipping rates to northern destinations and number five the south had no history either during the colonial period or in the early republican years as an industrial center the industry that did develop did not comply or illustrate the typical pattern while southern industry developed in cigarette furniture and textile manufacturing, most Southerners, for those who worked off the farm, typically worked for wages in the lumber and or mining industries. Mechanized enterprises with the employment of middle management clerks such as accountants, bookkeepers, and warehouse managers did not happen in the South. These men with good math skills were not needed. If they were, northern or foreign companies brought such staff with them. Instead, the South continued to be an extractive economy. Small companies processed for shipping raw materials. These products would be sold to a manufacturer outside of the South. Industry, when it did take hold in the South, followed a pattern. A Southern industrial company was locally owned by Southerners and its success was typically short-lived, lasting but one generation. Out of North Carolina emerged, by the end of the Civil War, a first major industry, tobacco which became known and advertised as far away as Egypt as Bull Durham cigarettes. Owner Jillian Carr advocated the use of time-saving machinery 
in his factory set on a 15-acre plant. By 1883, he had sold 5 million pounds of smoking tobacco. A worker in this plant could hand roll four cigarettes in one minute. But Carr knew he had to come up with the machine to maximize efficiency and profits. An 18-year-old Virginia boy had invented such a machine. By 1884, and after many revisions to the original machine, Bull Durham cigarettes were being manufactured in lightning speed, 200 a minute, at less than half of what a skilled worker costs to produce. Sadly, with economic competition, the 253 factories Carr established during the 1890s in North Carolina dwindled to 33 by 1904. The 1890s, this was a boom decade for another success in southern manufacturing. This would be furniture making. Such factories using southern wood and investment capital, but northern management emerged in Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia. Along with this pattern, we saw brick and tile manufacturing foundries followed providing the quintessential red brick look identifiable with symbols of authority, wealth, and power. Southern companies, sadly, had boom and bust years, capturing the ups and downs of much needed housing construction materials such as windows, doors, blinds, and other building products. As you can see, the South made an impressive beginning in tobacco, furniture, and building supplies, creating jobs and towns where there were none before, and a few would persist until the 20th century. While the production of iron and steel failed to live up to expected results by northern interest, the southern textile industry spread and prospered. The workforce grew from 10,000 in 1870 to almost 100,000 by 1900, boasting 32% of textile workers in America. And a third of these people worked in both of the Carolinas. Mills varied in size, but an average mill such as one in South Carolina by 1900 employed 377 people and typically mills were established near larger cities becoming a hub of employment for towns. Southern mill owning interests invested in the latest technology and electricity by the turn of the century. Southern textiles were shipped domestically and to international markets to include China, India, and Latin America. All the while, raw cotton, southern grown, dominated U.S. exports at 60% of all American exports. Perhaps most important, southern mills were located and owned by local individuals and employed locally as well, oftentimes entire families. But mill towns north and south were corrupting influences for children and offered dead-end jobs for the majority of the employees. By the 20th century, unions emerged to address education for children, better wages, and safer working conditions. However, unions were illegal in the United States until the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This would be in the 1930s. The mining and lumber industries that dominated the economy as the southern employer, again, we are in an extractive industry base. Not manufacturers, but companies that produce raw materials to sell and ship to others to manufacture. This was the typical form. Coal towns emerged in the Appalachian Mountains, 
similar to the creation of mill towns when industry arrived. With industry, especially in rural areas, this did not bring prosperity or progress. All the while, the landscape began to change. Southerners saw slag heaps grow in their green valleys, marring the scenery and farmland. In time, they began to fear what lie ahead. Coal towns grew up alongside railroad lines. Coal, like lumber and cotton, was heavy and cumbersome. Like mill workers, coal miners moved frequently to better their opportunities, but stuck to one industry, mining. Mining, unlike the textile mills, was in the majority a black male employer. Mill towns on the whole employed white, poor men, women, and children. Black women in mining towns only numbered about 25% of the population against the males. But families developed while the majority of men, 75%, lived outside of a family life. An examination of southern lumber mining, while not a specific industry to the post-reconstruction years, illustrates how an industry can dominate the marketplace while it could not have succeeded without northern money. Most counties from the colonial period had sawmills and lumber yards. Like in Maine, southern rivers clogged with lumber floating downstream. And this was a dangerous occupation for lumbermen, past and present. The event of accidents ran high due to the sheer weight of the product in efforts to fell and move it. In the 1880s, the railroad brought northern investors and their money. The use of the railroad to transport lumber replaced the slow moving and hazardous colonial practice of using rivers while it connected forests and markets in new ways, creating new wealth for some and jobs for others. Between 1881 and 1888, nearly 5.5 million acres of public land was sold to private investors looking to establish lumber mills. Investment came from Chicago, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. This was northern money come south. They financed at least 30 percent of the lumber industry from the 1880s. In the 1870s, the South only accounted for about 11% of the lumber produced in America. But by 1910, the southern industry of lumber dominated the market at 45%, even though the logging industry in the Pacific Northwest was a serious competitor. The lumber industry in New England and around the Great Lakes suffered due to southern successes. The largest sawmills were in Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi. Before athletics in American schools, debating teams were popular, but this fell into decline as college populations grew. Debating teams involved only elite membership, and athletics required a larger participation by students. Thus, it became easier to attract physical talent. Well known by citizens and foreigners living in ancient Greek and Roman empires, this covers a 3,000 year history, athletics fostered traditional ideals such as honor, dedication, and glory. Athletics today still offer these qualities while carrying on learning with elements of duty, teamwork, working through difficult or seemingly impossible situations against all odds. Past and present, athletics build character and traditions usually won on the battlefield. 
Industrial capitalism changed the social views and practices by Americans while away from work. Team sports as organized games of play fostered physical exercise and bolstered local pride in its citizens. For the most part, team sports were established in schools and by rival towns by the 1890s. With team sports, this seemed to reflect what was happening to the youthful nation, barely a century old. Team sports reflected a youthful, fit nature, strong and willing to defend their ideals. Men turned to baseball, boxing, and football to exhibit their masculinity. Women rode bicycles, enjoyed gymnastics, tennis, and swimming to show their grace. Southerners enjoyed team sports as well. After all, competition was long a part of the antebellum Southern culture that included horse racing, military games, and parades. By the 1900s, Southern sports arrived. But as expected, race complicated membership to team sports. Confederate troops had learned about baseball from the Union combatants, and when the North man come south during Reconstruction. By the 1890s, baseball was a well-established cultural attraction in the South, even in small towns, typically enjoyed by the working class. Baseball came to mining towns, too. In West Virginia, a mine owner built a baseball field with a grandstand. Some observers warned that competition might lead to violent results between the races. New Orleans had interracial baseball in the 1890s, and crowds at baseball games were interracial activities. But this did not last long. Southern towns with white baseball teams played southern towns with black teams, and this seemed to limit interracial baseball until after World War II. In the South, boxing did not catch on from the mid-19th century like it did in other places such as New York City that was heavily Irish, poor, and immigrant. The issue of race in boxing, especially in the ring, stood clearly in the way. Black fighters were often excellent, but this challenged white notions of the best man. While boxing matches were allowed in Chicago, a New Orleans newspaper argued it was wrong to pit a black man against a white man in the boxing ring. If done, this implied they were equally matched. While the number of interracial boxing matches declined, the practice did not stop. What made American boxing more respectable, as it's always been associated as a poor man's cheap amusement sport, was in part a men's club that was created in New Orleans. The Olympic Club built a 3,500 seat arena and established weight classifications, had referees, and arranged matches between boxers. Professional boxers wore gloves and the prize money kept increasing. Keep in mind boxing was considered barbaric men beating each other up until only one was left standing. But as boxers were more and more attending clubs and becoming trained in the art of boxing, so too did its respectability as a sport increase. Football came south by the late 1880s. It was long associated with college athletics thus attracting a more educated audience identifying with the college experience. It fit in well with the hyper-masculine paternalistic culture because of its colonial history in regards to the settlement by Cavaliers from the 1630s. During the Civil War, British aristocrats loyal to Charles I 
found plantation life in the South agreeable and profitable. This founding elite set the southern tone of life by establishing two principles that proved to be long-lasting. First had to do with political power. The educated elite that they should have the right to rule and organize government. The wealthy knew best how to govern and this would lead to family power and authority. Secondly, was in regard to knowing one's place. There was no social climbing that was acceptable in the South. You were respected for your heritage and status. It was expected to, well, let's just say subjugation of inferiors. And then there was protection of private property and deep commitments to duty and honor. By the turn of the century, Southern college football was enjoyed by thousands of spectators. For Southerners, football was much more exciting than baseball as it was dirty, rough and tumble game with high risk to life and limb. For some parents, the time-honored values that were character building made football attractive. Football eroded intellectual school cliques and created a more rugged fraternity brotherhood among students. Some college teams adopted rebel yells and confederate leanings, embodying a courageous past with glory and admiration. Football moved from southern colleges to high schools and towns. For the most part, southern women were spectators, but young women were encouraged to take exercise just like the boys. Like in ancient Greek, women athletes, yesterday and today, have beautiful bodies. Women played tennis and rode bicycles. Though public riding was considered rather a bold move for the middle class woman. A true southern belle should limit her athletics to racquetball, tennis, golf, and croquet, not disrobing for swimming or sitting astride a bicycle. Like her northern counterparts, the new woman came south. By the 1880s, southern white women were no longer assuming the long-standing, quiet, and submissive complete personality associated with a compliant wife or daughter. Southern women advocated intellectually their constitutional right to petition and address issues such as the following four. Number one, the question of age in regards to sexual or marital consent. Number two, the question to create reforms in regards to education, such as schools establishing or industrial schools for girls that would be established. Number three, the question to create legislation targeting the limit or licensing of alcohol establishments. And number four, this last question had to do with women's rights in regards to voting. This topic for Southern white women was especially heated. To them, it made no sense that the worthless, immoral, and shiftless Negro males could vote. Meanwhile, they were the ones that owned property. They paid their taxes, and in all reality, these property-owning females exhibited what it meant to be a citizen. By the 1890s in the post-antebellum South, the idea of the voting white women did not go over well with the establishment in regards to their ideals of paternalism and family order. Extending women's authority for them was a world turned upside down. This debate had begun at the 1890 Mississippi Convention. In some states, such as Mississippi, where there was a majority of population that was black, giving white women the vote could give southern white establishment an edge. 
Southern white men did not want to see their political corruption come to the fairer sex. This would ruin their delicate, beautiful, and noble nature. Other men criticized the move as to have sunk so low as they needed their women to reassert their own authority. Southern women and suffrage was debated from Texas to Georgia to Tennessee. Southern women advocated for other social changes as well that attracted an audience in favor of assertive females. While most Southern women were not the new women of the North advocating equal treatment and practices as enjoyed by men, most Southern women did form local committees to address issues that today we would call grassroots projects, such as the creation of kindergartens and charitable organizations to help the poor or orphaned. American black men volunteered and filled enlistment ranks during the Spanish-American War. Booker T. Washington saw this as a window of opportunity for the black man to earn the respect of whites. If black men committed to fighting in this war, he argued, it would show the extent to which the black man was willing to do for his country. Show his true patriotic nature, just like a southern white man. The president toured the South, himself a Union veteran, in search of support to fight Spain and Cuba. He witnessed the singing of Dixie and watched the waving of Confederate flags in parades. All the while, black and white southern soldiers fought gallantly, not only in Cuba, but in the Philippines as well. Northern black volunteers sent south to wait for deployment to Cuba, wrote home telling of stories of scenes they confronted while in Macon, Georgia, for example. Three soldiers in different situations were killed by streetcar conductors. While it does not seem probable that northern blacks were unaware of the customs and legally defined traditions in the South, these legal issues regarding segregation were enforced under the law. Blacks were to ride in segregated cars in regards to transportation. A black lieutenant from Ohio wrote his mother that he was horrified by the Macon daily public abuses he received on the street and on railroad cars. The war against Spain took many black men away from home, exposing them to new cultures and challenged their ideals as American citizens. In fact, while it opened the eyes of black soldiers to a non-prejudiced cultural experience, it did nothing to make life better at home. The lynching continued against blacks by whites in the South as it had done before the war. Jim Crow laws continued to grow and blacks continued to be segregated from white society. The war threw blacks and whites into a common goal set it seems on equal terms to which American society did not readily accept. Then at the end of the 19th century the cult of confederacy was in its heyday. The movement had begun after the Civil War ended. By the 1880s the defense of the lost cause was honored by southern citizenry in a nostalgic way that took concrete directions. This celebration of the honored Confederate soldier found recognition by town committees across the South in which the meaning of war was lost in the past and not understood unless a Southerner. The Gilded Age, this would be the decade of the 1880s, was a time of remembering 
while the world seemed to be in a hurry for change and evolution. While the federal government looked for evidence of a promising economic new south, southerners yearned to remember those who gallantly fought and died for their cause. By 1895, the United Daughters of the Confederacy created chapters across the South dedicated to the building of monuments to past glories and persons. Confederate veterans groups sprouted up all over the South, commanding a membership of between 25 and 30 percent of all living Civil War veterans. Veterans groups and the Daughters, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, raised money to erect monuments not hidden away in cemeteries, but built in the center of town. The members of the United Confederate Veterans were not famous soldiers. They were men from the rank and file, ordinary soldiers who had become insurance agents or accountants. The Gilded Age was a time of growth of organizations north and south. In the United States, it is estimated that nearly 500 social groups were established, which enrolled 6 million Americans as members. History and genealogy attracted many members, such as the New England Daughters of the American Revolution and the Union Army Civil War veterans who joined the Grand Army of the Republic, attracting over 50 percent membership of all living by the 1880s. What made the South distinctive? I would like you to think of the five following points. The South did not seem the same as the rest of the country. Number two, by its history and economy, it was set apart. Number three, its antebellum heritage was a civilization distinct, slower than the industrial north. Number four, to hold on to southern ideals of paternalism, a hierarchical society, not aiming to be pluralistic like the industrial north. And number five, desire to hold and honor a celebrated past that stood opposite from the North. Together, these issues set them apart. By the 1880s, Southerners wanted to recognize and celebrate their honored past. Towns erected some impressive monuments between 1885 and 1912. This was a white history remembered and glorified, with 9,000 whites attending and helped by dragging of ropes, they erected in 1890 a new statue of General Robert E. Lee to its site in Richmond, Virginia. Over 100,000 people attended the dedication ceremony three weeks later. By the 1890s, there was a monument to write this historic past down. And this was a movement that covered several areas from history to fiction. Confederate veterans were dying and with them their history would be lost. Fairs, parades, and the erection of monuments attracted large white crowds. Reunions of Confederate troops saw pain and hardship. One old vet seemed lost in the New South as he came for an, another age. At his reunion, he was run over by an electric car and killed near his camp at the reunion in Virginia. And Southern memories run deep. Honor and duty as central themes when used in book and film are ingredients for a bestseller. And the university-trained historian Margaret Mitchell knew this well. Atlanta Ray's daughter, young Margaret Mitchell, grew up amidst relatives who reminisced about life during and before the American Civil War. While born in 1900, 
the nation still possessed living Civil War veterans, both Confederate and Union, until 1911. And then, of course, there were the civilians. Mitchell's relatives, especially her aunts, told stories of a time long ago so different from the South of the 20th century. After leaving Atlanta for college, her mother insisted Margaret was to write down what it was like in the decades around the Civil War. Profoundly interested in history and duty-bound to honor the memory of her past and her heritage, Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind. This extensive story won the Pulitzer Prize for writing. The historical fiction quickly became a bestseller of 1937, followed by the blockbuster film of 1939.